blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. God of all creation, you have made us in your image a rainbow of every color, culture, gender expression, language, orientation, and nation. Grant that when we look at one another, we may see you expressed in yet another language of love. And grant that we may honor your holy presence in every life. We pray because of Jesus, who shows us the way. Amen. Amen. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from 2 Samuel. After the death of Saul, 
when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. David intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan. He ordered that the song of the bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Joshar. He said, Your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen! Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. The daughters of the uncircumcised will exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor bounteous fields. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul anointed with oil no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death they were not divided. They were swifter than the eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson in luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. A reading from 2 Corinthians. As you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. 
it is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. <coughs> when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hand on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, 
I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but is sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's mother and father and those who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. And th at this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and breath of life. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> oh, hello, choir. <laughs> this is exciting. Wow. Don't hurt your neck from over there. Please feel free. To, to watch the sermon on whatever uh, social media thing we are using right now, but if you're TikToking, I'm gonna know it. <laughs> I can see you. Well, from this incredible story of miraculous healing, I want to take you somewhere truly exciting. General convention. <laughs> The General Convention of the Episcopal Church concluded this week with a new presiding bishop and I think a, a renewed spirit. This year, I got to serve for the first time as an alternate deputy. So I, I got to go and I got to be, admittedly, a somewhat distant part of the action. Uh, just so you know, they are very strict about these things, a, an alternate can be in the gallery but cannot actually be on the floor of convention. There are, there are folks who will look at your badge to see if you are allowed to go into the place where all the decision makers are. Now, fortunately for us, there were many, many people there, but the Ohio delegation was in the back row, which means by being on the front row of the gallery, we were right next to our, our brethren and our, our kindred, who, who could then, two very important things, could come up to us and graciously fill us in between votes on what they were thinking and what was going on. But most importantly, because of our physical proximity to them, throughout the day, they could come over and share their snacks with us. <laughs> 
And let me tell you, their snack game was strong. <laughs> now, I got there on Sunday, first legislative day, but I, I arrived late because I had some family business elsewhere, so I didn't get into Louisville uh, until about 11 a.m., and I thought that I would, I would go on down and check in, go up to the uh, credential table and uh, be given my alternate badge and then go sit down and, and watch the action begin. I actually thought I was landing at precisely the right time, but it turns out I couldn't get in the door because the credential committee was also in session and, and you can only get credentialed very narrow windows between 7 a.m. and 7.30 in the morning and 1 and 1.30, which meant that by getting there at 11, I was out of luck. And so I went up to the one person who's at the desk who couldn't do anything, and I said, what can I do? And she, I said, can I go to the gallery? She said, no, you cannot do that. I said, can I go to the exhibit hall? Uh, no, I cannot do that. Um, may I sit here and pray? No, you cannot do that. Wait, no, you can do that. You can do that. And so for my first hour, um, I sat there at General Convention watching a door that would not open for me. Now, it, it's okay. I was not upset. There were reasons for this. It was my own fault uh, that I was there after credentialing it happened. Um, but I, I do have to admit, I do get the slightest tinge of, uh, of feelings um, whenever I'm not let inside. Whenever I, I feel like I'm on the outside of a door uh, that is being enforced at my expense. We, many of us, we've all experienced this in some way, sometimes in very major ways. And so even when I'm in moments like this where it all makes sense, there is, there is there was no injustice here. There was nothing wrong that happened. I still kind of felt that, that twinge of tenderness as I thought about those times in my life where I was not allowed in places where it seemed to me I really wanted to be. Now, the story ends very happily. I got in the, into the gallery after lunch, uh, and then, because we have a very gracious deputation, from Ohio, they make it a real priority to make sure that even the alternates get a little bit of time on the floor and get to hit the vote button every once in a while. So I got to vote on um, the president of the House of Deputies. I got to vote on, on welcoming uh, the new missionary diocese of Navajo land. I got to vote on approving the three-year triennial budget. Woohoo! <laughs> so I got, I got all the experiences, and then I got to learn, I got to experience in the convention, and because I am an alternate, I got to go home early. <laughs> so not, not a bad way to play it. So they're just thinking for a moment about being outside a room where all of the action happens. And there's nothing wrong here, no, no terrible thing done. But in that, let's go from there to this question of who exactly gets access. But let's actually talk about what happens in the gospel because it's very much about who can reach out that sounded like a, what, a phone commercial. Who could, because I was going to say reach out and touch. Who can be in physical contact with Jesus? Who, who can feel uh, the press of his hand against you? It's a question not just of pri privilege or of status, so much as a question of the heart. Who gets access to Jesus' healing touch? And I wanted to begin this thinking about who, get, who gets to be in Jesus' presence, but, but the touch is an important part. Right here at a number of places in the passage, there seems to be that question of, of can Jesus come and touch me, touch my daughter so that they can be healed? So the gospel is in part, or at least starts, as being actually about human touch, which cannot be scaled up 
which cannot be spiritualized, which cannot be abstracted. Who gets to receive the gift of tactile connection to the risen Lord, whether, whether by being born in first century Palestine uh, or by being in Jesus' uh, deputation, a very privileged place to be, or, or even by being someone who's just lucky enough to be near Jesus when he is in town and has enough time to come and see them and even lay hands on them. That is, historically speaking, a very narrow window of people. And I'm going to skip to the end of the, the gospel and the homily and to say there is enough <laughs> Jesus to go around, and yet we find all sorts of ways to worry about this. And when we worry, whether consciously, unconsciously, we begin to devise systems of who gets to be there, who can walk beside him, who stays at the far end of the crowd to wait a turn that I think we all really know is not ever going to happen. We begin with Jairus' daughter, a 12-year-old girl nearing death. Now, I will tell you, I have a very difficult time getting through this gospel because of, I have children 11 and 14. This is not an abstract thing for me. Any of us know that the thought of losing someone that is so close to us is devastating. So this just does not feel like an abstract parable. So imagine what's going on with Jairus. His whole world is collapsing all around him. I asked, did he, do you think he reached out to Jesus in deep faith? or plain old desperation. I think it doesn't matter. And I don't think it mattered to Jesus. The point was that Jairus' world was collapsing, and so he asked. That, that right there, is what it means to gain access, what it means to reach out and connect with Jesus. You simply need to ask. But the crowds were heavy, and there were many in that crowd who needed him too, whose situations were dire and urgent. But I'm going to suggest, and I think it kind of comes through, that some things are more urgent than others. Because imagine for a moment that you are Jairus and, and Jesus has heard you and is beginning to walk with you through the crowds to your home, but suddenly the crowds start to get thick and people start to fall in around Jesus. Let me ask you, do you think you would be polite? I'm pretty sure I would not be. I'm pretty sure I would be using every elbow and shoulder that I had to, to create a space. I am pretty sure that I would be running up and down every alleyway around that crowd to see if there is a faster way to pull Jesus out of the crowd and move him out. I would, I would, and I am not kidding, I would throw him on my back and I would run at full speed because every second matters. And when I see Jesus speaking to a woman who, who clearly is in need and wants healing, I might very well say, no, Jesus, she can wait. She has waited for 12 years. I have compassion, but right now, my daughter needs you right now. Who has access to Jesus' healing touch? Is it a zero-sum game? Because in this moment, in time and space, there really isn't that enough Jesus to go around. There's a lot of need, there's a lot of hurt, and there's one little girl who only has a few breaths left. But let's do what Jesus did, which was to stop this narrative even amidst our urgency to stop and listen to one, a different one entirely, which is to, he pauses with that woman who has been suffering for 12 years. And even though she was there with Jesus and could see him and almost touch him, almost was the best that he, she could do. 
The crowds were too heavy, and so she asks. Even though there's almost no way Jesus could hear her, she asks and she reaches out and she says, an act of, was it faith? Was it desperation? Who knows? Who cares? She reaches out and she says, if I just can touch his garment, his clothing, I will be made well. And then in this curious moment, because it doesn't happen a lot or it's not talked about, Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I just felt something go, go from me to you. I, I feel a download just happened. <laughs> and he turns and he knows that she has been there. And he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Be healed. Go in peace. Who has access to Jesus' healing touch? Who gets on the floor? Who gets to be made well? Is it, is it looks? Is it proximity to power? Is it time logged in the pew? Yes. <laughs> no. No. I wish. No. Is it the ability to prove that your suffering is more profound or more urgent than another? Is there enough of Jesus to go around? On Pride Sunday, we have a chance to reflect just a bit on that question. And as we grieve the injustice of normalizing a narrowing of access to those whose genders or sexualities were regarded as conventional or safe or correct, as we grieve that, we also see that there is a deeper reality to knowing who we are and a deeper pain to not being honored and not being let into the space of holiness and transformation. Civil rights are one thing, but convincing folk that Jesus doesn't see them or love them or forcing them to the back of the crowd, the Lord is too busy for you breaks our heart and cries out against the very reality of how God made us, how we are to see and know and love ourselves, each and every one of us, as beloved and well-made creations of the living God. That grief is real, but it is not the whole story. For pride is a celebration as well as we disrupt those narrow assumptions of human life that serve our false ego selves, but do so little to open us to a, the beautiful complexity of expression and relationship that is the fullness of who God created each and every one of us to be. Pride is not just about celebrating, it is about growing ever further into the expansive love of God. It is that growth, and that growth is for each and every one of us. I love being the parent of a non-binary child, learning through their eyes the beauty of queerness, though that also means grieving through their experience the heresy the false teaching that some can come near Jesus while others must keep their distance. The gospel teaches us in a simple way that there is enough Jesus to go around. 
But the gospel also convicts us in our idea that even whether it's the urgency of the moment or whether it's the fear that, that we are disconnected in time and space, how do we get our child, how do we get our own broken hearts to the place where Jesus can see and hear and touch us, which suddenly we as human beings take that fear and that anxiety and we construct a whole reality, reality around that where for some reason it now becomes okay to decide who can come near Jesus and who cannot. The gospel teaches that that is a fool's errand and teaches us that neither time nor space nor crowds nor arrogant use of power can keep any one of us from the healing touch of Jesus. What gives the woman who has been suffering for years access, she asks. She reaches out, she asks. She reaches in faith, in desperation, in hope. And she doesn't quite touch his body. The body matters, yes, touching Jesus matters, just as touching and tasting the Eucharist matter, but ultimately it touches a larger reality that Jesus' presence, Jesus' incarnation is more than one body in one place and time only, a body that in that moment could be kept from the crowds by, by disciples who meant the best. It's not that she touches him, which she doesn't actually do, it's that she tries. It's that she reaches out and she discovers that there is power resonant in the places and the people and the things that, that Jesus has already touched. It's that he is the source of grace, not the storage unit. For you engineer types out there, Jesus is a generator, not a battery. <laughs> and that this love cannot be hoarded, rationed, denied, or otherwise contained. Spirit recognizes spirit. And our awakeness is known in our spiritual garments. That means all the ways that we, we live and move throughout this world, whether we are not or not, we are thinking godly, Jesus-based thoughts at that particular moment. It's how your garments flow behind you because that is often how people are gonna reach out and connect with the living God. Our rational minds and our irrational minds as well, they know, though, how to build firewalls the Spirit knows how to work around that. Let's not forget, though, about Jairus, who is still there, who amid this conversation has been waiting patiently, and far too patiently, I might add, because in the time that Jesus has made this journey, his daughter dies. Do not trouble the Master any longer, they say to him, I think quite coldly, for your daughter is gone. It's over. It's done. Who has access to Jesus' healing touch? Who indeed? This child was separated from Jesus by just a few minutes, but that was a few too minutes too many. Not too many people but a hundred people, it's really hard to get through when they're all trying to grab Jesus' time. And when the difference is life and death of you or your child, it really doesn't matter if it's two minutes or 2,000 years. And yet Jesus is singularly untroubled by these things. Just as he seems untroubled by our question of, of who gets to touch him and who does not, because the thought does not seem to have entered his mind at all. He does not align himself with the sense of time and space that defines the story we read today. For him, there's no hurry. 
Because there's no one left out. There is no one who is left out. Everyone in faith is a part of this. It is enough to ask. It is enough to reach out in faith or desperation if that's where you are today or hope if you have that gift and you'd like to share it. To touch those garments and receive the outpouring of power and grace that is God's gift to us. If we but touch his clothes, we will be made well. We do not need the right badge or the right words, and we certainly do not need to fit into someone else's vision of convention or propriety in order to approach the Holy One. We are cleansed of our egos and our binary assumptions as we lay claim to this faith, as we grow, but also as we walk this holy journey together. And we also come nearer to Christ when we see the creativity and joy of godly life amplifying within us, taking on more colors, more expressions, more glitter, and even more grace especially more grace. This faith is what gives us the moxie to reach out, to touch Jesus' garment, and imagine and trust that we will be made well. This faith is what heals us and sends us out once again in peace. Amen. Together, let us stand and affirm our faith. You, O oh God, are supreme and holy. You create our world and give us life. Your purpose overarches everything we do. You have always been with us. You are God. You, O oh God, are infinitely generous, good beyond all measure. You came to us before we came to you. You have revealed and proved your love for us in Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again. You are with us now. You are God. You, O oh God, are Holy Spirit. You empower us to be your gospel in the world. You reconcile and heal. You overcome death. You are God. We worship you. Loving God, ingenious maker, in your infinite creativity, you have promised never to destroy the world you have made by sending us the rainbow the full spectrum of color as a sign of your constant protection and blessing. On this Pride Sunday, we remember those who have trailblazed for LGBTQ+, equality and justice, naming them now either silently or aloud. We pray for just rulers in our nation who seek to honor the dignity of every human being and pray for all who continue to fight for full equality, tolerance, and acceptance under the law. May all your children trust that they are safe in your care. 
We pray for those who continue to live under the threat of intimidation, oppression, or violence around the world because of their sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, or the color of their skin. God of life, help us to see you in all forms of identity and expression. May all your children trust that they are safe in your care. We pray for LGBTQ plus children and youth who struggle with isolation and shame, who have no space safe space to retreat to, or mentors who can teach and guide them through the journeys of self-discovery. Empower us to walk in the way of love, to welcome the excluded, and care for the vulnerable, to work for justice and rejoice in the spirit of life. We pray for families of LGBTQ plus persons that every child and adult may feel loved and appreciated for who they are. We pray that families' eyes may be open to understanding and acceptance and that those who profess Christ may love as he loved. In your name. We pray for the children of LGBTQ plus parents that you would protect them from bullying and teach them what love looks like through the affection and steadfastness of their parents and of affirming family and friends. Give each child the grace to shape the world into the image of your kingdom. We pray for the faith of LGBTQ plus Christians, that their trust in you would be strengthened and empower them to live into their fullest callings. Bless their lives, their work, and their relationships. May they be examples to those who have lost their faith and support anyone who has suffered under religious prejudice, intolerance, and exclusion, so that every child of God may find room in your outstretched arms of love. Loving God, masterful creator, our hearts are filled with gratitude and joy for a successful Pride Month and celebration of your LGBTQ plus children. We ask for your continued blessings on this community at Trinity Cathedral, committed to the care of all its members, of every race, gender, and sexual expression. May your gift of the rainbow ever remind us of your steadfast love and presence with us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. God, who made me in your image. Forgive me for the times I have not loved myself as you love me. Forgive me for the times I have hidden your light within me and the times I have refused to see the light of others. From this day forth, help me to recognize the imprint of Jesus within myself and every person I meet. By your grace, may we show your love to the world. God, who made us in your image, bless, protect, and keep us hidden in the joy you have for each one of us. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Peace. Where people get one. 
if you're inclined. Okay, all right. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to all of you here in the cathedral today. Welcome to the, those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad to have you. We welcome you. If you are new to Trinity uh, to, and would like to learn more about this place and these people, you will find along the base of many of the pillars information about Trinity, as well as a newcomer card that you can fill out and drop it in the offering plate or to hand it to one of us on the way out. If you are joining us online, you will find much of the same information at the very top of the website. And we would love to learn more about you and, and get to know you. So that's a great way to connect with us. Uh, we, we give thanks for our volunteer choir. You all look great and sound great, and we thank you. <laughs> at, they ha this was what we did at General Convention, um, and except they called it the All Y'all Choir. So all y'all. <laughs> If any of you, by the way, were, no, were following the, the services online and said, hey, the band playing is really good, that was um, the Odyssey Jazz Collective, which has roots in Ohio, which has roots at our, um, uh, at our 9 o'clock Abundant Table service. And that band, which is really uh, outstanding, is going to be playing at Trinity in the fall, as well as Christchurch Oberlin at a weekend at a date I can't remember off the top of my head, but it will be wonderful, and we hope you can join us for that. This morning, happy pride to all of you. I want to first thank those uh, at Trinity who have worked so hard to make this month what it was. I, I'm thrilled to say it, it is a part of our life that we honor and celebrate all throughout the year, but in particular, when we talk about uh, our gathering with other churches of the diocese for pride in the CLE, um, and, and, and of course, uh, for our space looking so beautiful and perfect today. We welcome Russ Pri Trippi. Um, thank you for your class earlier. And Russ is going to be leading an LGBTQ plus retreat for Trinity in uh, September, I believe, September 8th. So if, uh, if you'd like to learn more about that, and of course, Ginger has information. Oh, we've got lots of information, lots of, <laughs> lots of things to share. Coming up in just a couple weeks, at our Sunday schmooze, which is something we do once a month for, for, for a chance to gather and uh, get to know one another a bit better, we're going to have a democracy schmooze. Who doesn't want that? But it's really to celebrate um, a, a successful effort to gain enough uh, uh, signatures for the anti-gerrymandering um, um, amendment. It's an amendment that will be going, going before uh, the ballot. Uh, and, and I am so proud to say that Trinity, among the greater Cleveland congregations, um, Trinity will gather the most signatures of any congregation. And three of us, three Trinitarians, that's right, were in the top 25, which means they are all going to get a ham. I don't know if they like, well, no, it means we're all going to celebrate uh, two weeks from now after the service. And weather permitting, we're going to be out in the, the cathedral garden, the space outside of Cathedral Hall. So pray for good weather, but more importantly, mark it in your calendars and be with us. A great way to celebrate, a great way to enjoy a beautiful space, and also to get to know one another. Oh my, I can't, there's so many people over here. I forget about my left side here, so hi. Um, finally, is anybody celebrating a birthday or an anniversary this Sunday? All right, please. What day is your anniversary? Today. Today. Happy anniversary. How many years? 40? 10? You were 10. <laughs> we're not talking about that. Yeah. 45. <laughs> what day is your anniversary? Today. How many years? Seven. Excellent. We have... God be with you. What? We do? We have it? <gasps> oh, 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 oh. What day is your birthday? That's okay. We can, we can catch up. Maggie, what day was your birthday? The 15th. It's your anniversary. T Tuesday, how many years? Eight years. Craig and Lindsay. All right. God be with you. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and ever-living God, you have created us in your image. Look mercifully on 
uh, on, on Lindsay and Craig and Michael and Pam and Lois and Rich, who all come to you seeking your blessing and assist them with their grace, that with true fidelity and steadfast love, they may honor and keep the promises and vows they have made through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servant Maggie. As she begins another year, grant that she may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen her trust in your goodness all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 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 Happy birthday. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary to all of you. I invite you to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. Please stand. God be here with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is right and a good and joyful thing Always and everywhere to give thanks to you Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth 
For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. For in these last days you sent Jesus to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In Christ you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In Christ, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember Christ's death. We proclaim Christ's resurrection. We await Christ's coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Savior of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through whom we are acceptable to you, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God. 
now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
was the Lord of bliss to lay aside his crown for my soul, for my soul, to lay aside his crown for my soul. Todd, in the name of God and on behalf of our congregation, we send you forth bearing these holy gifts to Lori. May she to whom you go and visit share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. May you hear the prayers of all of us as we take the sacrament of holy communion from the altar of the Amen. Amen. Please stand and join me in the post-communion prayer. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world, 
and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. May the Holy One bless you and keep you, encourage you and strengthen you with the light of the Spirit, the love of Christ, and the power of our Heavenly Parent, today and forevermore. Amen. Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.